Hello everyone, I'm Claire Misko. I'm the CEO of the National Eating Disorders Association and today I'm really pleased to welcome Dr. Cal Carolyn Black Becker um, and she's going to speak with us today about some really uh, innovative and what I would say groundbreaking research on uh, the connection between food insecurity and eating disorders. Um, I want to start out just by uh, giving a brief introduction of Carolyn and um, her work. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Black Becker is a professor of psychology at Trinity University and a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in the treatment and prevention of eating disorders, PTSD, and anxiety disorders. Uh, Dr. Becker uh, is also widely published. Um, she's published numerous peer-reviewed papers. Uh, she also co-authored Exposure for Eating Disorders and two editions of Cognitive Behavior Therapy behavior therapy for PTSD, a case formulation approach. She's a fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, and the Association for Psychological Science. Uh, welcome, Carolyn. Thanks for being here today with us. Hey, thanks for having me. So I want to start off just giving you an opportunity to talk about um, the connection between food insecurity and, and eating disorders. Um, you know, what are you seeing? What really prompted uh, this research that you've undertaken? Um, so we first started looking at um, eating disorders and food insecurity for um, sort of, uh, actually it's, it's sort of a story is the best way that I can put it together. Um, so just for those people who are not familiar with the terms food insecurity and food security, um, food security um, basically means that you have adequate and regular access to sufficient um, and nutritious food to meet your um, to meet your needs. Food insecurity refers to um, the experience of having inadequate access and resources to um, procure uh, sufficient and nutritious food for you and your family slash household. Um, now, the idea of studying food insecurity and eating disorders was sort of antithetical to many people. I, I jokingly say that when I first started this uh, research, this is actually very true though, most people in the eating disorders field looked at me like I had two heads when I said, this is what we're doing. And they were like, why are you doing this? Um, and I think it seemed really odd because people have this real stereotype about who gets an eating disorder. So when we think about sort of the who traditionally we think of having an eating disorder, we tend to think of thin, white, reasonably affluent girls and young women um, who are not going to be food insecure. Um, and so um, the reason that we started doing this research, because I actually traditionally did research um, that really fit with the eating disorder stereotype, um, actually goes back to my, my teaching work. I was teaching a class um, about food to freshman students, first year students at Trinity University, and working with my colleague, Dr. Keisha Middlemouse, who is a political scientist who specializes in working with marginalized populations. And during the course of working together and also learning all about food insecurity myself as a teacher, um, we started talking about doing research together. And I had a couple of students come to me and say that they wanted to do research um, in psychology with me, in the, um, but working with marginalized communities in the city of San Antonio. And I was sort of juggling all of these things in my head. Um, I, I jokingly say I do my best thinking when I'm walking my dogs. And, um, you know, it suddenly struck me that people with food insecurity go through periods of time where they are unable to eat sufficient food. Um, and some people are just unable to get the range of foods that they need. But some people with food insecurity really are unable to access sufficient food, meaning that they go through periods of dietary restriction, albeit um, involuntarily. And um, that, you know, suddenly thought about a study that many of us in the eating disorders field are very familiar with, which is the work of Ansel Keys back in the 1940s, where he documented that men who were starving as part of the Minnesota starvation study um, so that we could study human refeeding started to exhibit some eating disorder behaviors. So we have long known that you don't have to restrict for weight and shape concerns, yet mostly we have studied weight and shape concerns as the reason for restricting because of the eating disorder stereotype. So I suddenly started thinking, well, wow, people with food insecurity might experience binge eating. Um, and then it struck me that there was another reason they might experience binge eating, which is that many people with food insecurity not only live in food deserts, but they also live in food swamps. Now, many of the people listening are probably familiar with the term food desert, but it basically refers to um, the fact that many people who live in more impoverished communities do not have good access to 
quality grocery stores. Um, instead, they have to buy their food from convenience stores or um, fast food outlets. Um, what people are less familiar with is the term food swamp. Um, and that refers to not the dearth of grocery stores, but actually the fact that you were just surrounded by highly palatable food. And research by Mary Boggiano and her colleagues, um, animal research with rats, has demonstrated that highly palatable food may be implicated in increasing risk for binge eating. So I suddenly thought, well, you're food insecure, particularly urban food insecure, you're surrounded by highly palatable food, which may increase risk for binge eating. You also go through periods of dietary restriction, albeit involuntarily, which may increase risk for binge eating. We should see higher rates of binge eating in people with food insecurity. And so we looked to the literature and found very little discussion of this and decided that we should study it. And uh, of course, that leads to my next question, which is what did you discover in your research? Right, so um, I remember uh, calling Keisha to calling Keisha up on the phone and saying when I first analyzed our data, um, so our first study had approximately 500 participants. We did this study in partnership with the San Antonio Food Bank, which is just an amazing organization and they've been fabulous to partner with. So I've got to give them a, a huge shout out, um, particularly during the time of COVID because they've been doing a Herculean task here in San Antonio. Um, so I called up Keisha and said, are you free? And she said, yes. And she came by and I said, you've got to see this data. Because what we had found was what I described as, as some of the saddest, um, sort of the most emotionally distressing data that I'd ever seen. But at the same time, some of, from a scientific perspective, some of the prettiest data. So from a human perspective, very sad. From a scientific perspective, um, unfortunately, sort of exciting. Um, and what we basically discovered, first of all, was that our sample was very, very impoverished with close to 60% of them earning less than $10,000 a year. Um, we divided our sample into four groups. Um, so we had one group that we called not food insecure, meaning that they didn't meet criteria for food insecurity, but they were sourcing their food from food pantries, which is a socially unacceptable way of uh, getting food. So that would suggest that they were on the margins of food security and food insecurity. The second group was um, household uh, food insecurity. Um, and that basically means that those participants were very anxious about accessing food. Um, they um, were often eating the same things. Um, they were not able to necessarily buy what they wanted to buy, but nobody in their household was going hungry. Um, we then had a group called individual food insecurity, and that meant that the adults were going hungry, but there were no hungry children in the household. And the most severe level of food insecurity was um, a group that we called child hunger households. So these were adults that were endorsing that they had hungry children at home. They were unable to buy enough food to feed their children. And the general presumption in the food insecurity world is that if the children are going hungry, um, the adults are even more hungry because most adults will um, restrict their intake to preserve food for children. And what we found was that as the level of food insecurity increased, so did pretty much all forms of eating disorder pathology. The such that um, by the time we look at the child hunger household group of food insecure participants, we were able to see that about 17% of them met the clinical cutoff for a clinically significant eating disorder. Um, and that is substantially higher than what we would see in com general community um, samples. Um, we saw that um, you know, approximately 16% um, of them were reporting objective binge eating. Um, another 12% were reporting overeating. Um, there was high rates of night eating. Um, one thing that we did not hypothesize and we were really surprised to see was that in that group there were also elevated rates of vomiting behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, across the board, the pattern was very, very consistent. That in this group with very, very severe um, food insecurity and in a sample that was very impoverished, so it went against the eating disorder stereotype. Um, our sample also coming from uh, San Antonio was predominantly Latinx, so this was not a very white sample. Um, we saw very elevated rates of eating disorder pathology and all forms of eating disorder pathology. We also found elevated rates of anxiety and elevated rates of weight stigma, internalized weight stigma. And I mean, this is really, uh, game-changing data because it does, you know, as you said, really go against um, and, and challenge so many of, of the myths and assumptions that have been made about eating disorders um, and really underscores what we what we talk about a lot is that eating disorders affect a range of, of populations. Mm -hmm. 
yes. um, and and here you're seeing it in um, in such a clear way through this through this data. Right, and I think what's really important to note is that we did a second study with almost 900 participants. Um, because the results were sort of seen as very, I don't know, counterintuitive, sort of going against the way the field had been thinking for a long time, enough so that people looked at me for a while like I had two heads, um, <laughs> that we thought it would be really important to replicate this finding and see whether it held up. And we did a second study with almost 900 participants and we replicated virtually every finding. It was a very clean replication, despite the fact that we gathered the data somewhat differently um, and the distribution across our groups was somewhat different. It just, it, it showed up absolutely again. Um, and so I think, I feel pretty confident that we really did come across something. Yeah. And, and what is next, Carolyn, for, um, for your research? And I think generally, when we look mm -hmm. at this issue of the connection between food insecurity and, and eating disorders, right. what do you see as the, the future of this research? Well, I think the great thing is, is that the field has already taken off and running with it. So we published mm -hmm. this first study back in 2017, and I just actually noticed like three years later, it has like 50 citations. And, um, you know, other researchers have really um, and, and young researchers have really, you know, um, really, uh, you know, taken notice of this and are, you know, looking at food insecurity in different samples and um, really starting to ask a lot of important questions about that. Um, where I think we are with the field is that we're really going to now need to start doing some longitudinal research. What we don't understand is, um, you know, the data that we collected was cross-sectional, meaning it was at one time point. So. Um, we don't understand which comes first, the chicken or the egg. I suspect that they are bi-directionally related, um, that if you have food insecurity and it triggers an eating disorder, well, that eating disorder may worsen your food insecurity. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have an eating disorder and then become economically unstable, unstable, then you're more likely to probably fall into food insecurity than somebody who maybe has um, a less troubled relationship with food. And so I think what we really need to do is start to look at this longitudinally and understand the trajectory. We also didn't gather any history of food insecurity, so we don't know anything about um, the lives of people who have food insecurity in, as, as children um, and what the developmental impact is on their relationship with food, how long lasting things are. We don't know to what degree people who lead, who, who um, move from food insecurity to food security, um, in what people do the eating disorder symptoms go away, and what people do they stay. Um, I do know from talking with um, some clinicians who work with um, uh, more impoverished people, uh, clinics that take Medicaid, um, take Medicaid, that they, once they saw this research and started screening for food insecurity, were finding food insecurity in their patients and finding food insecurity histories in their patients. So I think it's clear that not everybody, solving food insecurity doesn't make all the eating disorder pathology go away, but there's really so much that we don't understand. You know, I, I sort of consider this tip of the iceberg research. Like um, there's there's just a ton down there to discover, um, and it will take decades um, to do that. Um, but that's sort of where we need to go. Yeah, you have opened up a lot of very important questions <laughs> that need a lot more <laughs> exploration. Um, but it's it's such compelling research and so important, um, and I think really uh, you know has the potential to transform our our understanding of of eating disorders in its uh, in its myth busting, uh, so to speak. Um, Carolyn, do you have any, uh, we're, we're coming up on time here, uh, but I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share any uh, parting words with our audience, anything that um, you want people to know in terms of follow-up uh, in learning more about your research or um, anything else that you want to share with our right. audience. Uh, well, first, I just want to thank Nita for having me here and for also all the work that you all are doing in trying to really um, break apart that eating disorder stereotype that I think has been so problematic um, from a clinical perspective, from a research perspective, from a public health perspective. Um, so I'm just really glad to see all of us working to um, really take down that myth. Um, and I would like to end by just giving a shout out to my you know, fabulous collaborators, um, the students who worked on this project. Um, you know, in particular, you know, Clara Taylor, Bridget, or sorry, Bridget Taylor, Clara Johnson, um, Francesca Gomez, and of course, my partner in crime, Dr. Keisha Middlemass at Howard University, because none of this would have happened if it was just me. <laughs> the dream team. 
Uh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Becker, for being here and sharing more about your research. Uh, we will, um, you know, post more information about your work on, on our website, on the Need a Connections page. And um, I want to thank everyone for watching today. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.